2017 will go down as the year the ugly side of museum deaccessioning came roaring out of the closet as a museum with roots in its community going back 140 years proposed to sell its soul for an agenda described as the new vision. It started here in 1876 when Thomas Allen built the Berkshire Athenaeum to house a lending library, the Berkshire Historical and Scientific Association, and an art gallery an aesthetic masterpiece designed by architect William Potter, best known for designing libraries at Princeton University and Union College and the astonishing Alexander Hall at Princeton. Allen was the grandson of the town's first minister. Look at the iconography and decoration over the door. It was a tribute to science, literature, and art. There was a bequest in 1887 by Bradford Allen to acquire paintings, Plaster casts were donated in, 18, in the 1890s by Reverend Charles Spear. In 1898, Daniel Clark of Tyringham donated minerals, coins, Native American and antiquarian relics. The region's first and only historical organization was housed there. It grew and by 1903 had outgrown the facilities. Thomas Crane underwrote the cost of a new building structure uh, on the present location to be known as the Berkshire Museum of Natural History and Art. By 1915, this new museum could report five spacious rooms devoted to natural history, minerals, botanical reproductions, insects and shells, mounted animals and birds, Native American artifacts, statuary, Asian art, antiquities, plus four rooms of paintings, including the best modern art and many classical masterpieces, including originals by Rubens, Van Dyck, Joshua Reynolds, and Bouguereau. The library remained in the Athenaeum building, and technically the collection was mostly on loan to uh, the, the museum until 1933, when the two corporations were formally separated. This is Zenas Crane, scion of the Crane Paper Company, founded in 1770 and located in neighboring Dalton since 1799. He was one of the leading lights and philanthropists in late 19th and early 20th century Pittsfield. Among many wonderful local things, the museum displays some of the paper money the Crane Company was famous for. In the 1930s, Crane's widow, Ellen, underwrote expansions and improvements, including an auditorium and the Click Crane Memorial Room, a modernist masterpiece in keeping with the times. The family continued to support the development of the museum, more recently in the 1990s when Winthrop Crane donated a million dollars to a $10 million capital campaign. Art was a Crane family passion, and although and throughout the changes, sculpture and paintings, including works from the original Athenaeum galleries of the 1880s, remained a prominent feature of the museum. Despite the controversy and saga involved in the proposed deaccessioning of art to support the so-called new vision, the museum retains plenty of art and has no intention of abandoning the art agenda, just selling the crown jewels, hence the trouble. If we look back to the early catalogs and publicity about the museum, when it was housed at, in the Athenaeum, art was prominently featured. This catalog from 19, 1897 shows civic pride of place of Pittsfield in having such a collection. And like so much of the museum's holdings, we often find distinct local connections in the subject matter, including busts of founding donor Thomas Allen, and of Berkshire boy William Cullen Bryant, who made it to the top of the American political and literary society, and of Chester Dewey, professor of the once famous Pittsfield-based Berkshire Medical College, larger and more famous in its day than Harvard Medical School. Speaking of Harvard, in 1931, Stuart Henry joined the staff as a curator, later to become the museum's director. He was trained at Harvard under Edward Forbes and Paul Sachs in what was the first museum training program in the country. He stayed at Berkshire Museum for 45 years, befriending Alexander Calder, Norman Rockwell, and other prominent Western New England artists, making the Berkshire Museum a force in the art scene of the region at a time before the Clark in Williamstown, the Rockwell in Stockbridge, and long before Mass Mocha were a presence. Already famous from his work in the 1930s and 40s, Norman Rockwell moved to the region in 1939, first uh, to Arlington, Vermont, and in 1953 to neighboring Stockbridge. 
The Norman Rockwell Museum occupied the old corner store in Stockbridge beginning in 1969, moving to its famous and expansive new facility in the 1990s. In those days, Rockwell was a friend and fan of the Berkshire Museum, donating two masterpieces from the Arlington years that are now on the brink of perhaps being sold. He described Stuart Henry as my favorite director in my favorite art museum. He would surely roll in his grave if he knew his gifts, the most valuable in the museum's history, were being sold for this risky, ostentatious, so-called new vision. It's not just Rockwell. In the 1930s, with the development of the museum's little theater, Alexander Calder was engaged to produce two built-in architectural mobiles, among the first of the works that later made him famous. Calder moved to Western Connecticut in 1933 and was part of the then-emerging Western New England art scene along Route 7. Pittsfield, then and now, was the Berkshire County seat and the largest city between Danbury and Bennington, Vermont, a cultural hub. Part of the beauty of the Berkshire Museum rests in its history as an Athenaeum. Athenaeums are shrines to the unity of knowledge, places designed to house history, art, science, and literature in an age when most people didn't attend college. It's not only a noble idea, it's the best idea. Pittsfield doesn't have a historical society to speak of because the Athenaeum and the then, then the Berkshire Museum played that role. It's, it is loaded with local and regional art and artifacts. Work in local history is good and natural, a good and natural fit. Maps, photographs, artifacts. This portrait of Sir William Pitt, the city's namesake, speaks to the pride in honoring the great British champion of American independence during the American Revolution. Students of decorative arts who've never set foot in Pittsfield know this famous English historical blue Staffordshire, the famous view of the first church in Elm on the village green, the iconic 1790s meeting house designed by Charles Bullfinch that became a model for countless others throughout New England and as far west as Michigan. The meeting house is gone, but here is its original clock, a horological masterpiece from Charlestown, New Hampshire. Here is Lemuel Pomeroy, famous gunsmith and iron industry pioneer. Then there was poor crazy Sue Dunham, a local character and legend whose story is ripe for interpretation, inroads into social reform and mental illness. Then there is the story of Hannibal the elephant, who was killed when he fell through a bridge near Pittsfield in 1858, a backstory there for sure. And this remarkable rare collection of portraits of Pittsfield Civil War veterans and artifacts related to their service. The beloved natural history collections and dioramas. It may not be the American Museum of Natural History in New York, but dioramas are one of the coolest interpretive devices ever created, and the Berkshire Museum has a collection of them. Live snakes, lizards, rodents, Generations of children's and children and adults have paused and admired these wonderful live creatures. Then the fish, you gotta love them. Sometimes it's juxtapositions like this clock face and skeleton. If it was mass mocha, they'd call it art. The natural history collections recently and brilliantly reinstalled. Would the new vision do away with this? This is a perfect platform for teaching. Insects. It's hard to overstate how important the collecting and naming and studying the natural world was during the 19th century, during the birthing of modern science. To have all this still intact is beyond precious. Minerals, too, many from this region, a region with strong, a strong history in quarrying and extractive industry. Every facet can be used to deepen our sense of place and civic attachment. Extensive Native American collections speak to to a 10,000-year history of human, human habitation here. A few years ago, an exhibition titled Taking Flight, Audubon and the World of Birds was a masterpiece of playing to the strength of this remarkable collection. Mass mocha is wonderful, but nothing they do there is more compelling than this. This show had me smiling ear to ear and looking and thinking and admiring the creative process of a museum exhibition so clever and inspired. You could visit 500 museums, and I have, and you'd never find galleries like this. They are perfectly original and inspired, ready to light the flames of learning in minds young and old. 
Despite making do with half the resources they probably need, the Berkshire Museum has mounted many inspired and inspiring exhibitions that, again, play to their eclectic strength, like this one on the birth of conservation, or this on the power of place, landscape painting in the Berkshires. Monographic shows by artists like the late Brian Gill, a naturalist and artist as good as any in our time and a perfect fit for this museum. Or this one up now by Berkshire resident Morgan Bulkley, Nature, Culture, Clash. The Berkshire Museum is stretching to mount major shows by working artists like few museums in New England today. Alas, since Stuart Henry's probably too long 47-year tenure, it's been a revolving door of directors, one of whom apparently was pushed out when he refused to do what they aspire to do now, breaking the fundamental ethics of of the museum business by selling off the crown jewels of the art collection. One director left, then another, and another. Then collector donors withdrew as the revolving door increasingly made leading this museum a hardship post. Then finally, in 2011, the trustee found their man, someone willing as a last post before retirement to do the dirty job no one was willing to do, a job that is, to be sure, easier than squeezing every source imaginable, and imagination and resourcefulness are the key, to do the one job that's been most needed all along. Uh, by mounting a capital campaign to build an adequate and sufficient endowment. And if 10 or even 15 million of additional endowment is truly needed, this fascinating, precious 140-year-old museum is absolutely worth it. Things have been tried. The Fagenbaum galleries are novel and interesting. Now they've come up with the so-called new vision and the argument that if they sell $50 million in art, they can spend $60 million uh, on a radical makeover. The type, like the Smithsonian, that are all interactive, flashy graphics and pizzazz. Pretty soulless in my book. And absolutely the most expensive thing you can do per square foot. In theory, it will give the museum what it's presently said to lack. Pizzazz. But for who? And how much? And for how long? And then what? I call the museum de- this the Museum Designers Full Employment Act, and I mostly think this kind of exhibitory is a con. But there are plenty of folks with their hands out, ready to spend all the money as they liquidate the crown jewels of an art collection that is precious, deeply linked to this place, and the only thing of its kind between Albany and Springfield. At the heart of this plan is a betrayal, and the Rockwell family are now taking legal action because these pictures, two of Norman Rockwell's best, were given as an act of love and trust. This scene of a blacksmith shop in Arlington, Vermont, and this scene of Shuffleton's Barbershop, also in Arlington. Then there are masterpieces by Hudson and River School artists like Albert Bierstadt, of, here of the giant redwoods, and this, his view of Vermont from the New Hampshire side of the Connecticut River. Talk about power of place. Famous French academic pa- painter uh, William a- Adolph Bouguereau. Cornish school artist Thomas Wilmer Dewing, a peer of James McNeil Whistler, masterpieces. Great art, great artists and patrons, cultural treasures that speak to pride of place and Pittsfield's history as a cultural center of aspiration and accomplishment. It's been rough. It's hard to believe the Board of Trustees fully anticipated the backlash and resistance with 100 protesters turning out week after week. I've never seen anything like this. In half a century, there has never been a museum decision as controversial as this. It elicited the condemnation of numerous peer and professional bodies of donors past and present with a Facebook site with 1,400 followers generating some of the most animated and thoughtful discussion I've ever heard. A grim but fascinating museum case study that may be written about and studied for years to come. It doesn't have to end this way. The Berkshire Eagle has been heroic and relentless in condemning this decision. It's hard to know how the museum could possibly move on with their so-called new vision in what is now such a rancorous atmosphere. Why, for example, does mass transportation promote these attractions on the highways, but not the region's oldest cultural organization? That needs to change. Mass mocha is wonderful, but how many tens of millions is the state of Massachusetts pumped into it? There are several thousand people in Massachusetts who could peel off a million dollars for naming rights to galleries without blinking. 
It's Pittsfield's turn. It's time to step up and get off this long, hard carousel of short directorships and struggle. It's time to build that endowment. Forget the so-called new vision. It's all about money, and it's not unsolvable. Plus, the new vision would come at the expense of what makes the Berkshire Museum so special and alluring. For heaven's sake, stop in the name of love before you break this town's heart. Think it over. The paintings are down in New York at Sotheby's, scheduled to be sold on November 13th. The Massachusetts Attorney General is woke and hopefully ready to act. The board could stop this auction tomorrow and must. Love isn't enough, but it's a start. This has been a traumatic experience for many. What doesn't kill the museum surely will make it stronger. The time for faith and conviction is now. Stop the sale.